home for over 17 years of horse racing action. The Sport of Kings, featuring Tommy Wolski. On today's show, we'll meet a Santa Anita legend. We'll meet Woodbine rider Patrick Husbands. You'll get a look at the racing career of the Tin Man. We check out the career of racing legend Kelso. And now here he is, BC's ambassador to the world of horse racing, Mr. Tommy Walski. Our first segment today we know is going to get your afternoon off to a great start. It's a story about an equine warrior. His name is the Tin Man, who during his long career came back from many, many racing setbacks. And as you will see, the Tin Man story is one of heart and courage and one that you will enjoy. Once again, get your afternoon off. It's a great start. They come to the eighth fold and the Tin Man digs deep and finds more. Unlike his namesake of the silver screen, the Tin Man demonstrated tremendous heart every time he set foot on a racetrack. Deep he finds Sarafan chasing Gately on the outside, but the Tin Man will win it. But the path to glory for the son of Affirmed required a guiding force, found in the magic touch of the wizard of Santa Anita's main track, trainer Richard Mandela. The story of the Tin Man begins on a farm in Kentucky. Here was this little weanling, kind of a scrawny little guy. Hadn't really developed out much, but he had a look of class. For some reason, I saw something on TV. I think maybe they were talking about Roy, Ray Bolger, the dancer, and then the, it says from the time of the Tin Man, the Wizard of Oz and all that. And I thought, the Tin Man. I thought, my golly, I'll bet that's not used. So I submitted some more names. At the bottom, I put the Tin Man. Not really thinking they'd use it, but they did. However, after bowing both tendons, it appeared the prospect of racing the Tin Man was in doubt. My first thought was, this is a two-year-old that's unraced that bowed, bowed both tendons. His chances aren't very good at coming back. He said, I think what we ought to do here is go ahead and do the split tendon operation. He said, we've been pretty successful with it. And he said, if we don't, you know, I mean, he's going to just bow terrible and that's it. Mandela began to work his magic. After having both tendons surgically repaired, he also gelded the bay-colored horse. If you castrate a colt, uh, he, he tends to grow out of all of the bulkiness in his shoulders and his neck, and taking that extra 75 pounds or so off of the front end can make the difference, in my mind, of a horse making it back to the races or not. Not only did the Tin Man make it to the races, he went on to score impressive wins on the turf, including the Grade 2 American Handicap, Grade 1 Hirsch Memorial, the tin man will win it, and, the tin man wins it. and a romp in the San Luis Obispo. The Tin Man and Mike Smith totally demolished the field in the San Luis Obispo. But after a major injury to his ankle after the Clement Hirsch in 2004, it looked like the Tin Man's career was in jeopardy. Tore a lot of soft tissue. Um, even injured one of the sesamoidian ligaments, which are very dangerous to try and bring a horse back. And because of it, we even said to ourselves, if this comes back and shows us any sign, we're not going to fool with it. Mandela turned out the Tin Man to what would become his Emerald City, River Edge Farm in Buellton, California. Amazingly enough, as the Tin Man does, everything went away. The ankle went down, the, the sesamoidian ligament went down, and that, that's a very rare thing in the racing business. Uh, to heal that kind of a ligament just doesn't happen that often, just as healing two bowed tendons doesn't happen very often. I think the one thing that uh, Mandela does is that he takes a lot of time and gives them plenty of time, and uh, when they go back, they're, they're ready to start going to work. And work he did, rattling off seven of eight wins, the lone loss a second in the grade one Dubai duty free. We started racing him and he, and he won all those great races. He was better than he had ever been in his life. The Tin Man wins! He always had very good talent. You mix that with an old professional and you've got a, you got a modern day John Henry. One of racing's greatest stages, where the great John Henry made such an indelible mark, the Tin Man sought to add his name to the historic register of winners. Always had the greatest respect for their race because it was our first million dollar race. 
I can remember John Henry on TV and, and making the big fight that he did. I had run well in the Arlington Million a few times and really had the hunger to get it done. And they're off in the 24th Arlington Million. The Tin Man runs the half mile on a post in 50 and 1 fifth seconds. The Tin Man, this long time leader, the Tin Man, it's his million. The Tin Man has won for the wire. He was as good as life gets. Um, just couldn't ask for any more. The Arlington Million, wow, that just, everybody should have a shot to win the Arlington Million, boy, I'll tell you, that's the best. After placing in three graded stakes, the Tin Man underwent routine exploratory surgery. We do arthroscopic surgeries every day around racing anymore. Uh, and kind of take it for granted. Started to come out of anesthesia and had a terrible reaction. Uh, to the point he broke his knee, a couple of bones in his knee, and they're very important bones. They took away his stability to stand and turn and get up and down. Um, it was a terrible situation. Not only was the Tin Man's racing career over, his life was in jeopardy, as one false move could have proven catastrophic. We kept him tied to the, to the door in the, in the stall, so he couldn't get up or down or turn fast, uh, kept ice packs, kept pressure bandages on it. Nerve wracking's a good uh, description. We were all on pins and needles. Um, woke up several nights thinking about it. The Tin Man was vulnerable to the point that if he jumped and twisted that knee, I think it could have come apart. The first couple months were very important to get him through that and get the initial healing, because without it, the knee was not gonna hold him up. But he, again, the great patient, the ability to heal that he always had came through, and we got there. After over seven years together, it was time to say goodbye. You ready to go, buddy? Huh? I remember the last day. Now, he's been in that corner stall for years. There have been a lot of vans pull up and back up and load horses and go out of this barn, and he never took great exception to it. But I remember that day when the van backed up. He kicked the wall and squealed and bounced around in the stall. See you, buddy. He knew that, he knew something special was up. Now, how, how he knew, I don't know. Typical day for the Tin Man at River Edge Farm now is he's got a nice, fancy stall up there, much fancier than our racetrack stalls here. He gets taken out and put into a sand pen to kind of let down and move around and, and uh, get used to being a little freer than he has been here. It's a slow process of Give him a little bit of freedom at a time, let him get used to it, let him toughen things up, strengthen up those legs again. He has provided for my family everything that you could hope for if you're a breeder and owner of thoroughbred horses that you would hope for. I could see myself sitting around telling some old timers this great horse I used to have. And what a pleasure he was. What a good race horse. The Tin Man is just exuding class. He's gonna come trotting home. And what a connection we had between us. What do you want? Hmm? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For years, one of the top jockeys here in Canada has been Patrick Husbands. Husband says you're about to learn when he first arrived here from Barbados, things didn't go exactly the way you would think. Here's Patrick's story. For racing fans in the United States, the sport of thoroughbred racing has gone 30 years without a champion of its most hallowed achievement. Not since Steve Coffin's harrowing victories aboard Affirmed in 1978 has American racing seen a Triple Crown winner. But that doesn't mean the same can be said for all of North America. 
and Canada salutes the Breeder Stakes winner and the Triple Crown champion. Wanda was better than wonderful this afternoon. He was magnificent. Canadian Triple Crown winning jockey Patrick Husbands has been a prominent figure in Canadian racing for over a decade. But his love of the game began in his native Barbados, where he would compete every evening against his older brothers. And everything was about a race. We had the cows, we had to bring it on the evening, we raced the cows, we had the sheep. Everything we do is race, 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 race. Patrick's father, Walter, was also a jockey and shared his knowledge of the track with all of his children. But just as Patrick's career was beginning, Walter Husbands passed away. It's pretty tough. I felt he being there, you know. I was his idol, you know what I mean? And all the words he had say, say to me, up right now, they are speaking for the sub. Patrick would continue to ride successfully in Barbados for the next four years, but soon found it was time to move on. My brother begged me to come to Canada. I went to Toronto. I was in Toronto for a month. I would buy and couldn't get on a horse, couldn't get nobody's attention, not even gallop a horse. So I went to the beach track in Fort Erie. I was there for three months, and I started telling my brother, you know, I went back home. Luckily, help would come from a man Patrick would soon come to know very closely, Woodbine-based trainer Mark Cassie. His brother was working for me, and he, he said, my brother's riding a race today. Would you watch him ride? So I watched him, and um, the horse bolted at the top of the lane. Patrick never stopped riding, and he won the race by a nose on the outside fence, and then the horse jumped the outside fence after the race. And I was like, well, I don't know how smart he is, but he's fearless. Mark become a dad to me, and I become Mark's son, you know what I mean? Any advice I want, I call Mark. When Patrick first started for me, I was training for a farm called Mockingbird Farm, and the only horses we would get would be the leftovers that weren't sold, and I'd say 50% of them were either uh, crazy or nuts. Patrick used to go and get on them in the gate, and, and you know, he can get along with a crazy horse. I like fun. I like to tease horses. I like to see horses buck in. You know, I come up that way, I come up breezing horses and bailing off, which you all were saying that you are crazy. That's how he come up. With his close partnership with Cassie and his affinity for horses no one else would ride, Husbands quickly made a name for himself in Canada, winning four consecutive titles as Canada's outstanding jockey from 1999 to 2002. In 2003, he would ride Canadian Horse of the Year, Wando, to victory in all three legs of the Canadian Triple Crown. But the final race, the mile and a half breeder's stakes on the Woodbine turf, would be a true test of both Patrick and Wando's medal. You know, Wando always on the lead. So there's no way you're going a mile and a half and you can win on the lead. So Mike was asking me, what are you going to do, Patrick? He said, I just want to play by ear. Well, they're off in the Breeders' Stakes. Stritzy. Show water is showing early speed. Terrace when the guys are getting fly, I take a hold, and he didn't like it, and he started to run off on me. So I get him to put, I put him behind the leader, right on the leader heels. The rider was on the leader, was looking for me. He was looking left, looking right. I told the other rider, he's on your tail, he's on your tail. He's on your tail. He's on your tail. And then all on the back, the guys had me trapped. The, it was all over me. I had no way to go. And I see the only way to win from here now is make the dash. And they make the dash by the tree of pole. And everybody on fold, everybody made the dash too. And I pause after about four strides. I pause and all the way ahead. And then I get to the outside. And then when they start to come, the crowd will start to roll. Here comes Wando on the outside to take the lead. Showwater is back in second. They come to the final 16th, and Canada salutes the Breeder Stakes winner and the Triple Crown champion. In 2006, Patrick rode in his first Kentucky Derby aboard the Cassie Train Seaside Retreat. When I was, uh, when I was coming up, you know, as I say, my dad taught me a lot of things. And my father always said, one of these days, you can be riding in the Kentucky Derby. We was coming through the tunnel, and when they started playing, whole oh, Kentucky. I had all my goggles, and tears just started running from my eyes. I'm like, Daddy was right. The next year, Patrick and Mark would team up again. 
this time to become the first to win Canada's Triple Tiara, the Triple Crown for Phillies, aboard the always unpredictable Sealy Hill. Sealy Hill was an interesting filly. She, uh, you never knew which direction she was going to run. Patrick, in fact, he, it's funny, Patrick had won the, uh, the Triple Tiara, and he said to me, middle of last year, he said, I still don't know how to ride this filly. After the run for the tiara, Patrick convinced owner Eugene Melnick and Mark Cassie to bring Sealy Hill to California to run in the 2008 Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. Beg Eugene and beg Mark Cassie, please just give this horse one shot. And Mark said to, Mark said to me, Patrick, you sure you know what you're doing? I said, yes. I break her and I had to last the whole way and I wasn't worried. So when I swing home, I wait, I wait, and then a big gap open up by the eighth hole, and she come from like last to first, like that. Right on the outside, forever together, and now the long shot, Sealy Hill, forever together, forget it. Right in the Breeders' Cup, and you last, and then next minute, you bust through the crowd, you just get beat in the nose at 25 to one. I mean, what more can you ask? Now, after all the success Patrick and Mark have had together in Canada, they have begun to focus on the two things that every jockey and trainer dream of, wins in the Breeders' Cup and Kentucky Derby, something that they don't see either one doing without the other. 13 years of being in Canada, I've been mean, actually nearly every major race, you know what I mean, and so it's, no, it's time enough now for me to win the Breeders' Cup or Derby. That's, that's what I'm focusing on right now. You know, Patrick's kind of like a son to me now, and um, I enjoy winning, but I don't know if, if, if there's as much fulfillment if he's not aboard. Um, we have a bond, and, and it works, and um, so it was nice to have our first derby, derby runner together. Now we just have to have our first derby winner. Don't go away. The Sport of Kings will be right back. Our next piece looks at two horse racing legends, one a horse and one a jockey. First, it would be Kelso, five-time horse of the year, and I did say five times, and his rider, Hall of Famer, Ismo, Milo, Valenzuela, who recently passed away from a long illness. This is the story of Kelso. No horse dominated American thoroughbred racing over such an extended period as did Kelso. Mrs. Richard C. DuPont's marvelous gelding was voted Horse of the Year for five consecutive seasons from 1960 through 1964. By your host from the Count Fleet mare, Maid of Flight, Kelso possessed a hard deer-like quality, slim, racy, efficient. His one vulnerability appeared early in his racing career and kept him out of the Triple Crown events. That flaw, a faulty stifle, disappeared early enough to allow him to win the Jockey Club Gold Cup at three. At four, Kelso joined Whisk Broom and Tom Fool as only the third horse in history to win the venerable New York Triple, the Metropolitan, Suburban, under 135 pounds, and the Brooklyn Handicap, under 136. Here, Kelso rolled to his third Woodward in succession. Crimson Satan coming on third. Carry back, back to fourth, and Garwall is fifth. Coming through the stretch, that's Kelso in the middle of the track with never been for the lead. Crimson Satan third. Carry back fourth, and Garwall is fifth. What are yards to go? It's Kelso drawing away by four lengths, never been second. By 1964, Kelso was pitted against yet another generation for King of New York, and the Woodward that year provided one of the great turf dramas of his career. His principal foes were Gunbo and Quadrangle. Gunbo, a natural speed horse, was sent straight away from the gate into the lead by his jockey, Walter Blum. It would be up to Milo Valenzuela on Kelso to force the pace early and keep up the pressure, else the race would be a runaway for the speed horse. Dropping back to last. Coming into the stretch now, that's Gunbo and Kelso whipping and driving on the outside with Quadrangle along the ramp. Coming through the stretch, it's Kelso getting his head in front. Gunbo alongside second, on the rail, it's Quadrangle third. Kelso on the outside, but Gunbo hasn't given up yet. 20 yards to go now, it's Kelso and Gunbo heading head and nose to nose. As we go over the finish line, it's a photograph to the finish. The 
question was, who won? The writers didn't know, neither did the trainers. Minutes passed while the placing judges inspected the magnified image of two nodding heads separated by an infinitesimal margin. Gunbo had defeated the game old veteran this time, but Kelso merely picked himself up and came charging on. First, he won the Jockey Club Gold Cup for the fifth consecutive time while Gunbo sat on the sidelines. Then, in Maryland, he faced his young rival in the Laurel International. Kelso had run second at Laurel on three previous occasions, leading some to doubt his grass ability and world-class competition. In the fading light of November 11th, 1964, Kelso met his newest rival for the final time, with Horse of the Year honors on the line. Gunbo again had an easy early lead, and Kelso must depend on his own courage to overtake his youthful opponent. For a moment, it seemed a rerun of their torrid Woodward duel, but appropriately, the gold of the Maryland afternoon was matched by a flawless performance as Kelso set a new American record for the mile and a half distance, running the final quarter of a mile faster than the first quarter had been clocked. He was trained all his career by Carl Hanford, and when Kelso was retired, he led the money won list with more than $1,900,000. But more importantly, he had won the love and affection of millions of people. Don't go away. The Sport of Kings will be right back. I first met Eddie Logan several years ago when I was riding that Santa Anita racetrack in Southern California. Logan was perhaps one of the coolest guys one could ever meet. Now if you're wondering what Logan does, for over 70 years, Eddie Logan has been shining shoes at Santa Anita racetrack. Now at 97, guess what he's doing? Same thing, with a smile. Eddie is a link to our great and glorious past. He's just the greatest performer as Seabiscuit or John Henry or Shoemaker. At 97 years old, I, I, I am what I used to be. How many 97-year-old men do you know that are still showing up at work and still doing their job? Call me the footman out there now. So I take care. I take care of that. I take care of the racetrack guys working on the racetrack. He does actually a pretty good job on your shoes too, and he'll let you know it because he's the footman, and uh, he's a real kick, and he makes everybody smile, and you know he just he's a comfort level here. He is a, a constant. He knows what's going on. He knows all the people. He's an absolute delight. He's always the same, never changes his character, is always the same, day after day. You know, he's been here forever and, and he's, he's such a character, such a good person. It's hard not to be attracted to go sit there and get your shoes shine and have a visit with one of your best friends. He has been at Santanita as an employee since Santanita opened its doors in 1934. Doc's through. He bought the track in 32. But they had it ready to go in 34. So when we got the track built, then they got me over there from Arcadia. I was working at, and I was in Santa Anita. You know, Eddie's experienced it all. He's seen racetracks uh, change, and he's, he's been here since day one. He's just, uh, he's part of us. It's Seabiscuit on the rail, Seabiscuit and Kayak. Seabiscuit and Kayak, they're coming down there, and Seabiscuit, Seabiscuit wins it, a new world champion comes down there, he wins it, and listen to the crowd, all by themselves. They got him in the race and the horses they thought could beat him didn't have no chance to beat him. Uh-uh. It's just, it's just fun to see how he do it. He it, it do, it do, it do it so easy. Eddie can go on and on. He can tell you stories all day long. That's my problem. He loved playing baseball. He was with the Kansas City Monarchs and he played shortstop and he was called Stubby. 
which I think was just, they said he was just round like a little bowling ball, and he thoroughly enjoyed it. Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. Yeah, well, well, that's good. I played an exhibition game with him. That's how I started out, playing an exhibition game. That's how I learned how to hit. He also loved boxing, and that's what brought him to Los Angeles. He came here because there were more prize fights and he could make a lot more money. And here he is. Doesn't matter if they're shining shoes or the governor, if they're good people and they're trying hard to do their job right and they care, one's just as valuable as the next and there's nobody more valuable than Eddie Logan. When you walk down that walkway and you hear his voice, it just, it's me and Santa Anita, you're here at the races. <laughs> It gives you a real comfort feeling knowing, you know, there's Eddie. He's been here for years, naturally, and, and he's just a, a real fixture. How many tracks have an individual that has been with them for almost 70 years who puts his heart and soul into it every single day? It is with great pride and admiration that Santa Anita honors Eddie Logan today and for all time with the Eddie Logan Stakes. Presenting the trophy for this, the inaugural running of the Eddie Logan Stakes, is the one and only Eddie Logan himself. Eddie, I'm told, give you the leather, you get it together, and you, all you keep saying is you're the footman. I am the footman. Get the leather, come see me. I'm together with leather. <laughs> it's a good thing that we have a stakes race named after him. He deserves it. He could just sit in a chair and watch TV and smoke his pipe. But that's not what he wants to do. He wants to be useful, contributing to society, and enjoying what he's getting back from society. It's hard to think of Santa Anita without Eddie because they go hand in hand. So it would be a great loss. I mean, just just his his banter, his just him being there, it would be a huge loss for Santa Anita. Santa Anita will survive without any of us, but it'll survive a lot better as long as Eddie Logan's here. I just love it. I love the game. I love it. Okay, that's it for this edition of the Sport of Kings, and on behalf of everyone here. We want to say thank you for allowing us to spend this last half hour with you on this Saturday morning. Two things to leave you with. We want to thank our friends south of the border at HRTV for supplying most of the footage that you saw today, along with check out their website, HRTV. It's a new website, hrtv.com. And most of all, don't forget next week, two big stakes, the BC Derby, the BC Oaks. That's next week. Remember, keep them straight or we will get you on that final turn. Enjoy the weekend.